Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Goldgaard, Dean of the School of International Service, and what a great treat it is to uh, welcome you all here for this event. And uh, I'm guessing as I look out uh, at, at who's here that there are a lot of people who belong in the Bosco or and or Schroeder fan club uh, here at the School of International Service. So that is not, uh, you're, you're in a very large, uh, a large fan club group as a matter of fact. Uh, I'm very delighted with our ability to uh, partner in this effort uh, and more broadly with the Stimson Center and uh, I'll introduce Ellen Lapson in a moment but um, we're very pleased that, uh, that this past year we've been able to develop a partnership uh, with the Stimson Center and we held a wonderful event there uh, in the spring semester uh, and I'm very pleased that we're able now to host an event here at SIS this fall and look forward to the next event uh, at uh, Stimson in the spring and uh, before I introduce uh, Ellen and uh, then our moderator David Bosco who's going to uh, to introduce the other two folks up on the stage uh, I do want to also give a special welcome to Bill Dirch who's here from uh, the Stimson Center and who's uh, been responsible there for uh, their program on the United Nations and it's just great to have a a, uh, a discussion here as the UN General Assembly uh, gets underway uh, for us to really have an understanding of uh, the issues uh, that are at stake and uh, particularly on this question that was raised in the uh, in the title uh, challenges to the global order can the United Nations manage current conflicts and I um, promised in my own tweet out about the event that we would get beyond just saying no so uh, <laughs> I, I, I do look forward to a full event and also I just want to point out um, you know if you use the hashtag uh, SIS event uh, you can uh, join the conversation about this and if you see me on my phone I am not checking my email I am uh, joining the conversation so uh, just want to make that clear and um, so let me introduce uh, Ellen and David and then Ellen's going to just say her, her own couple words of welcome uh, from on behalf of the Stimson Center and then we'll turn it over to David uh, Ellen Lapson is president and chief executive officer of uh, Stimson and she also directs the Middle East Southwest Asia program uh, which covers issues including Gulf security and the strategic repercussions of the Arab transitions. Uh, she joined Simpson in 2002 after 25 years of government service uh, uh, and that service included uh, positions as vice chair of the National Intelligence Council and special assistant to the U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations. And our moderator today, our very own David Bosco, who is a professor here in the School of International Service, uh, is a past Fulbright scholar and also a contributing editor at Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, in his prior life, he was a lawyer uh, and um, focused on international arbitration, litigation, and antitrust matters. Uh, he also served as political analyst and journalist in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and as a dire deputy director of a joint UN-NATO project on repati repatriating refugees in Sarajevo. And uh, he's written uh, two important books uh, that are relevant to this. One, Five to Rule Them All, uh, which is a book on the United Nations Security Council, and then his most recent book, Rough Justice, on the International Criminal Court. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ellen for a few words and then to David. Thank you. 
Well, thanks, Jim, and thanks to all of you for joining us on a day where you might want to sit outside um, and have a, a late afternoon uh, siesta. But uh, we're really delighted to be the co-hosts of this series of occasional conversations on issues in international security. Um, it's truly my belief that think tanks and universities have a complementary role to play and uh, having this partnership allows us to reach a student audience like yourselves, as well as a downtown audience of people who are more, perhaps more directly involved in public policy uh, analysis and even public policy making. Um, I, I really do think that we're all in the game of generating ideas, knowledge, information for use by uh, governance, governments, uh, not just the U.S. government, but other players in the international system, and that we can uh, work together to give, you know, different disciplines, different perspectives, um, and uh, somehow together uh, add to the collective wisdom. Think tanks obviously are also a, a place for students to come and be interns. Uh, we sometimes, I think, pride ourselves on being able to give people a first professional opportunity as you move from your academic life to a, a active work life. And so I hope you'll uh, think of that when you learn more about the Stimson Center. So Stimson, as Jim said, has long been a center of excellence on these issues, on issues of the UN, global governance, and how they hook up to problems of international security. Um, Bill Dirch and Alison Giffen both do uh, have different uh, analytic and research interests right now, but together we cover a pretty wide swath from genocide prevention, civilian protection, reforming institutions, and most recently we've launched a collaboration with the Hague Institute looking at global governance, security and justice. How does security and justice come together in the international system, or are there gaps, and are, are there creative ways to think about them? So I'm really uh, very, very happy to um, be here for the second in this year's series, and we look forward to uh, more pro uh, productive collaboration together. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to Dean Goldgeier and to um, Ellen Leibson, and it's very exciting to be part of this collaboration between SIS and, uh, and the Stimson Center. Um, I'm going to make a brief uh, plug um, for those students who are interested in UN affairs and UN peacekeeping in particular, um, might want to research that further. You really can't do better than um, a book that has been produced by the Stimson Center's own uh, Bill Dirch on the evolution of UN peacekeeping. For, for me, I was telling him before the event when I was an undergraduate researching these issues, it was... Uh, was really the core text that I relied on. So I um, would highly recommend that to anyone interested in these issues. Um, this event couldn't be better timed in terms of uh, what's happening up at the UN. Just as I was coming down here from my office, I got an email saying that the 69th session of the UN General Assembly has officially opened. So we're only about an hour behind. <laughs> and. Um, it's, uh, that means a couple things. It means uh, that traffic up on the east side in New York is probably uh, more snarled than usual. <laughs> um, uh, but I think more importantly for us, it means that, that we have an opportunity as the UN convenes in really what is its kind of shining moment each year with foreign ministers and heads of state flooding into New York uh, for meetings at the UN, a chance for us to kind of sit back and say, here we are 69 years after the founding of the United Nations, what role is this organization playing when it comes to managing conflict and managing crisis in the international system? And it is hard, at least for me, to recall a time when uh, the UN faced a more complex array of issues, um, including, of course, conflict um, in Ukraine, the recent Gaza conflict, um, the uh, horrific uh, Syria, ongoing Syria civil war, the particular conflict that's emerging between the several states, including the United States and the Islamic State. Um, and then on the public health front, issues like the Ebola crisis and how the international community will respond. So it's an amazingly complex and serious agenda um, that the United Nations faces. And all of those issues will be discussed, whether formally or informally, by the heads of state and foreign ministers. But at the same time, I think we can ask, how influential is this body really uh, in, in the resolution of these issues? 
Is it more of a talk shop or is it a place where progress is actually being made on the management of conflict and crisis? And I think we have um, two, two panelists today who are really well positioned to help us analyze that question, um, but from very different perspectives. And I just wanted to introduce them to you um, now. Uh, Professor Michael Schroeder is, the, uh, is a prof professorial lecturer and director of the uh, Global Governance, Politics, and Security Program, um, otherwise known as GGPS here in SIS. And um, he's focused his research on the UN system broadly, global governance, international cooperation. He's working on a book right now on um, how, it, how effective uh, the heads of international organizations are. So the UN Secretary General, the head of the World Bank, can these individuals be influential players? Um, his work and research has been published in places including Global Governance, um, Christian Science Monitor, US News and World Report. Um, from a different angle, we have, and from the Stimson Center, we have um, Allison Giffen. Um, and she's a senior associate there and a co-director of the Stimson Center's Future of Peace Operations program. And she is focused in, partic in particular on an issue that um, the UN refers to all the time and which has really become a recurring theme at UN meetings, which is the protection of civilians um, in conflict. And um, she has been involved in a number of different programs uh, related to that, including um, in Sudan, Sierra Leone, and Colombia, some of those with Stimson and some of those with other organizations. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to go first to Professor Schroeder for kind of an overview of the UN's role in uh, the management of conflict and crisis. And then we're going to turn to Allison for a more detailed look at UN peacekeeping operations and, and UN operations in the field. So Mike, to you. Thanks, David. Um, <laughs> first, let me just um, particularly say thank you to, to Dean Goldgeier, uh, Stimson President Elaine Lapson, uh, for inviting me to join this panel. This is, a, this is a great opportunity for me, and it actually forced me to really think a little bit more broadly about where my, what I really actually think broadly about the UN at this moment in time. So that was really a helpful intellectual exercise. Um, and I obviously welcome Allison and you know, David. It's great to be on a panel with two people whose work I truly admire and I learn a lot from. I'm not just saying that, so David asked me easier questions later on. Though if he chooses to go in that direction, I won't argue with him. Um, so the broad question, can the United Nations resolve uh, current conflicts? Um, I think as Dean Goldgeier alluded to in the tweet he sent out, I mean, the obvious answer here is, is no. It's not resolving these conflicts, not even close. Um, but the story I want to tell is that it's important to understand what the UN, at least parts of it that I'm going to talk about today, is designed to do well and what it's not designed to do well. And I think that will help explain the particular way it's addressed uh, the conflicts, particularly the ones in Syria and Ukraine, uh, and to a lesser extent Iraq recently, um, that it's, it's sort of facing. Um, so let's really start with what isn't working. Um, I think at the sort of broadest level, the UN Security Council, which I'm sure most of you, certainly those in my class will know, is really the intergovernmental body charged with peace and security. And it's proven utterly incapable to carry out its UN Charter mandate to help achieve peaceful resolutions of disputes. I think that's safe to say. At the end of the day, the permanent five members of the Security Council are simply, at least one of them, is too invested in the conflict, in any given conflict, and they really hold competing interests. And this is sort of translated, for the most part, into decision-making paralysis, as major powers sort of wield their veto, or at the very least threaten to wield their veto, uh, in order to stop uh, decisions going through that they don't like, or that would hurt, potentially, their interests or their allies. If you think about Syria, um, Russia's, I think, vetoed four uh, resolutions uh, that have sought to uh, punish the Assad regime. Uh, indeed, the Council's sort of real main accomplishments here have been uh, one resolution mandating the UN, um, several branches of it, to destroy the Assad's chemical weapons stockpile, uh, and more recently to create a humanitarian relief corridor uh, without the government's assent after uh, repeated violations uh, by the Assad government. Uh, the second, of course, the paralysis and the councils plagued its reaction to the Gaza conflict, where it was really unable to help bring about an early end to either the Hamas missile attacks and infiltrations that sort of terrified Israelis, uh, or to restrain Israeli, the Israeli military campaign that left over 2,000 dead, uh, the majority of whom were civilians. And of course, in Ukraine, the crisis has now killed over 2,000, um, displaced thousands, triggered Russian intervention, uh, and sown insecurity around the region, and threatened at several points uh, to escalate to a military standoff between the US and its allies and the Russians. So if you look at that in sum, there's really sort of uh, these political conflicts inside the council have three major in, 
implications. Number one is the most straightforward one, just inaction. There's been few actionable mandates or, or concerted pressure on the parties themselves to end the fighting. Um, you know, in, in the Ukraine crisis, there was some Cold War-esque sort of theatrics and debates, but not really a whole lot of formal resolutions. Uh, the second implication is exclusion. Uh, in Iraq and Syria, there's no real interest in having the council play a supervisory role. Uh, Richard Gallen wrote a great piece. After all the, the role that UN has played in the Iraq conflict for the last 20 years, it really seems to be marginalized in this most recent round. Um, there's some talk about the president kind of slipping ISIS into the uh, Security Council session that he will chair, but it's clearly not going to be the center of that debate, although I'm sure it'll come up. Or it'll be central, but it won't be part of the central to the resolution itself. Uh, and finally, just undercutting peacemaking. Without sort of concerted uh, counsel behind it, UN mediators and the Secretary General have parties. Uh, in Syria, I think the best example, the UN Secretary General's um, appointed mediator, first Kofi Annan, uh, then Lakhdar Brahimi, both cited this complaint when they resigned, with Brahimi insisting that without Soviet pressure, he simply could not get Assad to accept the role of kingmaker uh, in return for stepping down. So I think those are the three big problems with the obvious political conflicts and ones that most people are familiar with. But there's, I think, an underappreciated problem um, in that the Security Council has really been also unable to mobilize wider support because of these political conflicts, especially from other regional powers who don't necessarily are not permanent members, who could, in theory, add their voice and bring an, an end and pressure to them in these conflicts. In the Ukraine, India, Brazil, and China have all abstained for the General Assembly resolution that condemned the annexation of Crimea. Uh, and moreover, in the more recent BRIC summit, um, the members essentially did not necessarily talk a whole lot about the Crimea uh, crisis. Uh, they refused to criticize um, Russia for that annexation or to expel uh, Russia. Uh, and in fact, quite the contrary, the BRIC summit itself seemed to be an opportunity for these members to publicly uh, counter Western efforts to diplomatically isolate Russia and to send a message um, that they would stick to one area that they would be comfortable cooperating is preventing isolation from any from the rest, uh, from the West of any one of them. And I think the silence of these governments uh, partially reflects the resentment um, at really not having a seat on the council, especially for Brazil and India, but more generally sort of feeling excluded from decision making on matters of global uh, peace and security. And I think even more recently, this sort of hesitancy to support any measures that the Western powers are viewed as taking the lead as uh, partially a reaction to the belief that Western-led forces, especially in Libya and also the 2003 Iraq war, where resentment lingers, highlight to them the excesses and hypocrisy of the sort of liberal institutional order that Western governments champion and often use to condemn other countries. So I think that's really the major, to me, the big disappointments and the big challenges ahead uh, for the UN and especially for the major powers operating, working through the UN to address these conflicts. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that they are playing a role, if not in resolving conflict, they are playing a role, at least in the margins of managing these conflicts. And I think that's important to keep in mind if we're going to look and ask ourselves a bigger question, which is, are we better off with the UN? And where should we focus our efforts at potentially improving the situation short of these political conflicts um, reconciling themselves? The most obvious one is on the margins, the UN has managed to reduce some human suffering. It has provided or coordinated the distribution of humanitarian relief. It has exposed those actors who have committed the worst human rights violations often in these conflicts. And it has been able to sustain an albeit turbulent peace process which potentially could one day open up for a broader, uh, more comprehensive agreement. To give one example, in Syria, BAN's representative has supported unofficial inter-party dialogues among all sides, especially when the negotiations broke down in Geneva, and arranged local ceasefires at one point to allow civilians to leave and humanitarian relief to get into Homs, which had been without, where people have been uh, starving for months on end. Uh, the Secretary General had worked with the Office of the Prohibition on Chemical Weapons, and they've recently declared that they've managed to eliminate at uh, 96% of Assad's stockpile, uh, by no means um, the ideal solution, but a start. And on top of that, more recently, have put together a detailing, quite credible report that the Assad regime uh, has used chlorine gas against his population and raised pressure on it uh, to, uh, at the very least, respond, if not the international community, take action. We'll see how the more recent developments help change that pressure. Uh, and finally, the UN is still uh, the primary mobilizer, coordinator, and in many cases, distributor of humanitarian relief. Um, to give an example, UNHCR, the High Commission for Refugees in the World Food Program, uh, currently uh, served about 1.7 million refugees outside of, um, outside of uh, Iraq and about 3.7 million in, or inside of, uh, outside of Syria and about 3.7 who are still stuck in Syria. That's a pretty large number of people to provide any relief to given that 
you know, they have very little operation in the field. They have to kind of build up from scratch. The host governments themselves have a lot of issues. Uh, I think that's a relatively remarkable feat. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't solve the problems or the suffering, um, but hopefully provides at least a little relief. And I can't imagine it being done in the absence of a UN coordinating mechanism. Uh, do I have a few minutes? Mm -hmm. Let me just finish then with the other um, thing that I think is often forgotten. Um, the other thing it does is it can help manage man major power relations. And sometimes at least, it's hard to obviously measure this, but contain major power disputes. That it can really prevent regional disputes where major powers do have these strong competing interests from escalating into direct military engagement. In other words, it can help see sometimes dampen the prospects of war. Now obviously this is hard to measure since it's the dog that does not bite. But I think it's an important contribution that often gets overlooked. Um, and I think actually David's book, um, Five to Rule Them All, does a pretty good job documenting it. I'll say better, it does a good job documenting it, uh, especially during the Cold War era, where it really was useful for the two uh, competing superpowers, where they often conflicted in all these conflicts around the world, and was useful for two reasons to manage their relations. Number one, informal cons consultations and ongoing informal cons consultations uh, are an excuse to keep talking rather than taking escalatory action. Back rooms, hallways, and now uh, the informal consultation room provides really low-cost ways for the permanent representatives of these major powers to keep consulting, to keep negotiating. Um, unlike formal negotiations, which can break down and therefore put pressure on the parties themselves to potentially escalate or do something else for their allies or their own interests, the council is really always open for business. If not, the council chamber itself, these sort of back rooms and consultations. And permanent reps are always able to consult without signifying that they're ready to make concessions. So they can always go in front of the camera and say, we continue to work on it, we continue to defend our allies, we continue to push our position, and hopefully buy themselves a little less pressure to potentially go the next step. Second mechanism, besides being an informal consultations, to buy time, hoping that something a more um, opportune um, or the conflict becomes ripe for resolution, is the council's a, a public theater, a chamber, um, that major powers can really use to appease hawkish domestic and international constituencies. The council chamber, as well as the media scrum outside, if any of you ever watch video footage, um, are really opportunities to sort of express your resolve and how much you care and how you're willing to do anything for your cause or for your interests and your allies and to reaffirm your commitment to those interests and allies. So I think for these two reasons, it helps manage. It provides, it helps dampen the need to potentially escalate the conflict. And I think these two functions sort of fell off our radar screen in the 10 to 15 years after the Cold War because we were so used to a world of US primacy where other major powers tended to defer to the US, or at least to acquiesce to it. And as a result, I think we tended to look at and measure the council strictly on its ability to resolve conflicts with US leadership. But now that countries like Russia and China are more confident, more willing to engage in brinkmanship with the US to get what they want, I think we're going to see these, this function of the council become increasingly important. And I think you're already seeing it in places like the Ukraine, where we really have seen this sort of public theater play out, where you've seen sort of very Cold War-esque style discussions and heated discussions, partially for the cameras among Samantha Powers and her Russian counterpart. Uh, and you're both still also, my guess is, and the history books will show this, but this is just a guess at this point in time, uh, that you're going to be hearing about a lot of uh, consultations. We hear about the two sides continue to consult, and hopefully this buys them a little bit more time uh, instead of potentially moving to a tit-for-tat of escalatory measures, which potentially could trigger something uh, in Estonia or one of these other areas with Russian minorities, which is, you know, or move beyond the sort of eastern uh, Ukraine area. So I think for those two reasons, it's helping to manage relations. It is not by any means resolving it, but I think that's worth keeping in the back of our mind before we decide to discard this as a forum altogether. Thank you very much, Mike, for that um, great overview of kind of the, the geopolitics, the current geopolitics and the role of the UN. Um, I think it's easy to forget that when we talk about the United Nations, we are actually talking about an organization that has more troops deployed abroad than uh, I think than almost any country, maybe with the exception of the United States. Um, and we have more than 100,000 UN peacekeepers out on missions in a variety of different places around the world. And uh, I think, Allison, maybe if you could give us a little bit of a sense of kind of what they're doing, how effective they're being, what are the impact of these UN operations? Thanks very much, David, and thanks to um, our hosts for having me here. Um, David, or Mike talked a little bit about sort of the strategic top-down approach. I want to talk about the bottom-up approach, which is when you can actually get in there on the ground, um, what you can do. And so I'm going to start to answer this question about whether the UN can manage conflict. 
uh, by talking a little bit about South Sudan, where I came back from just a few weeks ago. Um, as many of you know, in December 2013, there was this broad uh, political conflict that broke out, and it quickly spread across the country in just a few days. And it took on some ethnic tones to it, but it was very much um, characterized by widespread and systematic violence against civilians. So we started to see atrocities very quickly. As a result, we now have 100,000 people who are harboring inside UN bases, UN peacekeeping operation bases in South Sudan seeking shelter. We have a million people who have been displaced by violence. And we have four million people who are in need of some form of humanitarian assistance. Given that that has all taken place over the last eight months is pretty um, incredible. And the 100,000 people sheltering on UN bases, in other words, they've sort of become wards of the UN, um, is unprecedented. While I was there, um, I spent two days just speaking to people inside of these protection sites, inside the, the bases in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. And one woman asked me, or said to me, initially we hoped that this war would only last two days or one week, but now it's taken almost half a year. So what is the plan for UNMIS? Is it ready to protect us? When are we going to be outside? Will they protect us for the next 10 years? 100,000 people inside UNMIS bases for the next 10 years. Can you imagine the logistical resources, humanitarian assistance that would be needed to both protect them and sustain them? Now, th this one voice and the dozens of voices that I heard are not representative of the over 90,000 people, close to 100,000 people that are there. Um, but we did hear very many similar questions that remind us that regardless of where you are in the world, if you are being deliberately targeted with violence, you expect the UN to come and do something. And that's particularly true when you have a peacekeeping operation on the ground. And it's not just the people in conflict, it's the UN member states, as we know. The UN deploys more peacekeeping operations into contexts where there's egregious violence against civilians than into any other conflict situation. And there was this recent UN report that acknowledged that. It says, peacekeeping is one of the most important tools used by the international community to protect civilians and probably the only area in which organizational performance can literally mean the difference between life and death for a civilian in a conflict zone. So the UN recognizes, it, although it is not always politically accepted, that protection of civilians is going to be one of the priorities. And these high expectations are somewhat understandable. As David was saying, there are 120,000 peacekeeper, peacekeeping personnel deployed around the world right now. And the international community invests $8 billion annually to support those. So you would expect high investment, high return. It's not always the case. Um, and I want to give you just a, a little bit of background, again, on South Sudan and why um, our expectations may be too high. So there was a peacekeeping operation that deployed in Sudan in 2005. When South Sudan became its own country, it, the peacekeeping operation that was there was rehatted into what is called UNMIS, as I mentioned before. It was then there from independence until 2013. Um, and it still is there now, but under a different mandate. All of, the for, all of the characteristics that you see um, before mass atrocities occur were present in South Sudan. So you had armed conflict and other forms of instability, a record of serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law, economic deprivation and related disparities, weaknesses in state structures, motives or incentives to commit atrocity crimes, the absence of mitigating factors, and the presence of actors with the capacity to engage in such crimes. That is a long list of indicators that we look for when atrocities are going to occur. All of them existed in South Sudan. And then on top of that, what you need is sort of triggers for violence. And six months before this conflict broke out, the president of South Sudan dismissed half of its cabinet, including his vice president, who was his political rival during the previous civil war. Um, there had been a lot of violence that occurred between he um, between the president and the vice president during um, South Sudan civil war. So all of these indicators were here, and it, it begs the question, can the UN actually prevent or, or even just mitigate, let alone manage the violence? Um, and I suggest that part of the problem is that we're asking peacekeeping operations to do too much at the same time. So some of these peacekeeping operations go out, and they have 56 different tasks that they're given. And just to give you an example of how diverse these tasks are, often they're expected to help to set up and run free and fair elections. 
they're expected to extend state authority, which means in a lot of these contexts, you have very sort of centralized states that have um, parts of their country that are very marginalized and fragile. So the idea is how do you get some of these um, government leaders back out there? They're involved in the political processes and negotiations, transitions from conflict to peace. They're involved in rule of law and establishing that, security sector reform, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, human rights, etc. In addition to that, they're supposed to do the protection of civilians. All of these uh, different activities that they're expected to do from the time they deploy dilutes resources. To give you an example, in South Sudan, they had both the protection of civilians and all of these state building extension of state authority plus recovery and development objectives from the time that they started their mandate um, after independence. It is extremely expensive to have troops across a large geographic area to extend state authority and at the same time be able to put your troops in places that are most vulnerable to violence. There aren't very many roads. It means you have to fly in all your water, all your food to all of these troops that are spread out across your 10 states in South Sudan. That's ex it's extremely expensive. It also slows down deployment because you've got to do all the planning to get them out into all of these areas. It makes a peacekeeping operation inflexible in a dynamic situation. If you're this spread out, doing this many things, um, all at the same time, especially when um, peace hasn't been consolidated very much and there's still a lot of crisis going on the ground, when crisis flares, the peacekeeping operation has trouble shifting its resources and it ma its mandate. They're very slow um, operations. It's like turning the Titanic. And it also creates tensions and trade-offs within the peacekeeping operation and with its leadership. So on the one hand, the peacekeeping operation has to maintain the consent of the parties to the conflict or the state to stay there on the ground. But more importantly, it's also got to sort of keep good relations with the state to keep them moving on security sector reform and DDR and all these things that the state doesn't really want to do. At the same time, it's supposed to be protecting civilians regardless of who's perpetrating the atrocities or the crimes. And often we know that it's the state perpetrating the crimes. So it's got to try and get between the perpetrator and the vulnerable population, either by force or through political negotiation, or it's out there trying to at least report on it and get the information out, which doesn't make anybody happy. So there's this tension that the peacekeeping operation constantly has to balance. What we see then is this result of a very sort of, what we're seeing now is this, the result of all this is very top-down approach, where a lot of the resources are working at the state level, at the national level, and there's not very much going bottom up. I would suggest that what we need is a more sequenced or phased type of a peacekeeping operation. Um, and it's not a question of whether the peacekeeping operation necessarily does things, but it's a question of when. So for example, if we could get smaller forces on the ground initially during a protection crisis that could move faster, that are more willing to use force, and some, sometimes that's better than trying to get an entire multi-dimensional peacekeeping operation down. And it's sort of what we're seeing now. In the Central African Republic in Mali, the African Union sends in the troops first because they can move faster. Um, and then the UN peacekeeping operation deploys. Or you get a unilateral deployment from uh, the French, for example. The second thing you need is you need the right civilian capacity. So we always hear uh, human rights and humanitarian NGOs beating the drum for more troops on the ground to protect civilians. But what's missing from this is the need for all of the other components that do the human rights monitoring, that are the protection of civilians advisors for the leadership, the people that do early warning and conflict prevention, mediation, and reconciliation. These are the folks that actually get out there at the local level and do bottom up um, conflict prevention and reconciliation. If you look at a situation like the Central African Republic, where you have communities that have committed atrocities against each other, we're going to need really widespread reconciliation to try and break the cycle of violence there. Otherwise, it's going to continue because the, the need for revenge is very strong and there aren't very many um, uh, institutions to hold people accountable. Impunity is quite um, widespread. And then the last thing we need is to set up the right mechanisms in these early stages. So for example, peacekeeping operations need what we all assume they have, which is some sort of system to gather intelligence, analyze that intelligence, tell the peacekeeping operation where the threats are coming from, who's perpetrating those threats, um, who the vulnerable populations are. Uh, another thing that we think is really important is what the populations feel about the various protection actors, what they feel about the peacekeeping operations themselves, um, because that's going to determine whether the populations are going to 
you know, actually work with the peacekeepers for protection or not. So those things all need to happen in the very early stages. And there are some state building, capacity building, and other things that we maybe could ask peacekeeping operations to do farther down the line. And then the last thing we need to look at, I think, is uh, comparative advantages. So again, it's not whether, but it's who are we going to ask to do all of these activities. And what we find in peacekeeping operations, there are often very short honeymoon periods between a peacekeeping operation and uh, the host state government or the parties to a conflict. So for example, when there's a crisis like in Mali, where we saw the big coup, um, all of a sudden the government wants a peacekeeping operation to come in and sort of help them out. In Congo, when you get the fall of Goma, all of a sudden relationships improve between the host state government of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the UN peacekeeping operation we have there. But those phases can be quite short. And when they are, it means that a peacekeeping operation has relatively little leverage to have influence over the government than, say, a, a donor nation or a regional um, neighbor. So, I think that there needs to be more thinking about whether it's a peacekeeping operation, a UN agency, a bilateral donor, uh, a, a neighbor, did I already say the World Bank, um, who's doing um, these different activities on the ground to try and figure this out. Um, I, I don't want to fully condemn the UN and UNMIS for what, it, what happened in South Sudan. A lot of things are beyond what a peacekeeping operation can prevent. I do think that there were many steps it could have taken which we can talk about in Q&A if you'd like. Um, however, uh, we, they should be uh, recognized that they did let these 100,000 people in and that they are providing protection for them. And in the Central African Republic, where um, yesterday the, the African peacekeeping force was rehatted under a UN hat, so we now have a, a peacekeeping operation there called MINUSCA, um, it, it's recognized that the African troops, the European Union troops, the French troops that were on the ground there uh, for the last many months did create some semblance of stability and were able to help protect some populations, although of course it wasn't 100%. So I do think when it comes to protecting and doing some of that conflict, at least prevention and mitigation at the lower levels, there's a lot of potential, but there's a lot that we need to do to really rethink what these peacekeeping operations need to do their job and what we're asking them to do at what point in time. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, it's really incredibly valuable, I think, for people like us who study the UN and people interested in it to have a kind of on the ground perspective of what the actual challenges facing peacekeepers on the ground are. And you've laid out a kind of daunting array of different challenges. But with the same similar conclusion to uh, where Mike left us, which is the UN is not good at doing a lot of things. And yet, I take from what you said that the situation in many of these places, however bad it may be, is probably better for the presence of the UN than it would be otherwise. Um, but let me, let me, if I can, as, as moderator, pose a couple of questions, or maybe at least one question to each of you. And then we'll open it up, I think, to a broader discussion. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just go back to you, Mike, on one point, sure. which is you referenced um, the, the kind of resentment on the part of, um, say, a Brazil or um, an India, um, uh, Germany, Japan, I guess, uh, that they don't have Security Council seats. Um, some of you may have followed with the issue of Scotland uh, possibly leaving the UK. There's a question arising as to well, the UN Charter says the United Kingdom is a Security Council member. You know, what happens if, if Scotland's gone? Are we still talking about the UK? Um, that's, I think, not likely itself to be an issue. But this broader issue, clearly, of whether the organization represents um, the, the world as it is, is very much alive. And um, so I guess if you could address the prospects or what you see as the prospects for reform of the structure. And you, if you could include in that response maybe some kind of reference to these proposals that have been discussed about somehow limiting the veto power. Because you mentioned the Russian vetoes in Syria and the US uh, <coughs> effective veto in, in, in Israel-Gaza situations. Um, and there are these ideas floating around that we should either require two vetoes or we should, there should be a responsibility not to use the veto power in a mass atrocity kind of situation. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, on UN reform and structure broadly. The old chestnut of Security Council reform. Yeah. Um, so it was funny. I, I was actually listening. I read something, I think, uh, this morning uh, where they asked the outgoing GA president what the state of 
the former Special Security Council membership, and he said, as always, we've got lots of great new ideas, and I think we've moved forward, but we're no better off than we were a year ago. So I think the answer is that the prospects are not good. Um, will the Scottish, uh, would a Scottish vote of independence turn the tide and suddenly cost um, France and, and UK to rethink whether they should both have seats? I'm skeptical, but um, I guess we shall see. I mean, you're absolutely right. There's, there's still tons of proposals on the table. Um, my sense is that, um, that all those, the G4 countries, India, uh, Germany, Japan, Brazil, have by no means given up the, the belief that they should have a seat and they will continue to campaign for a seat. Um, the argument that, it's, that the council, at least the permanent membership, is really an outdated reflection of the balance of power after World War II and both fails to recognize the, the major contributions, whether it's India as a leading troop contributor to peacekeeping operations uh, or Japan as one of the largest uh, donors to the budgets of the UN, voluntary budgets of the UN and its agencies. At the same time, the politics are still there, and I don't think they've fundamentally changed. The competing interests, whether it's the so-called coffee club of like, countries like Italy and often Canada, my own homeland, who really worry that they're going to be like, basically relegated to third-tier status if there's this sort of second group of you know, either permanent or, or, or renewable seats that they can't get access to, or that another group of members gets a veto. Uh, and of course, the P5 themselves, who all have their, you know, tend to champion particular mem new new additions to the council, whether it's the United States at one point backing India and Japan and Germany. Uh, but at the end of the day, most of the P5 are not really willing to put up much political capital to support that because they know it would water down their own influence. Uh, I do think that they think that um, it would not necessarily. And then you get the question of desirability, which I, I think is still an open question. I'm not sure I've actually come to an answer. On one hand, there's absolutely no doubt that the legitimacy of the council's decisions are at stake based on its representation, that without reform to improve regional representation uh, and the emerging powers giving them greater seats, fewer states, the argument goes, will defer to the council or contribute to helping implement these, these big decisions, costly ones, ones where they put their own troops in harm's way. Um, at the same time, it's not clear that in a large council would be any more effective as a decision maker, particularly if they, if they, in the unlikely event that they pushed through a proposal that actually gave new vetoes. I think it's highly unlikely. But I think it's just as possible. The last time we saw all the, you know, I think at one point Germany, India, and Japan, is it, that all had a seat together as non-permanent members. And it, it's not, the council by no means started to show any sort of new life to it. Um, and so most people were kind of disappointed this was an opportunity, at least on thematic issue areas, to push forward. And they didn't really. Um, so that's, I think, a very open question that needs to be debated, this legitimacy question versus efficacy. In terms of this voluntary agreement to restrain, this is a, um, Sort of a, a proposal that I think the one David's referring to, pushed by Liechtenstein with France. And, uh, France has been, yeah. Yeah, suggesting that really what the, the P5 could do at the very least in order to show that they are trying to adapt to the world and particularly the mass atrocities being committed is that they would voluntarily agree to refrain from casting vetoes or have some sort of shift in the veto structure um, that when the most serious human rights violations took place. Um, I remember we, you know, and, and I think there is some serious consideration of this, at least, you know, um, the US government. It says that it's at least considering this proposal, um, whether that's any more than, I don't know how far that's actually gone through or how high up that's gone. Um, that being said, there's a lot of open questions. Who would get to decide that this threshold's been met? At one point, France said the Secretary General, if he certified that mass atrocities had taken place. So even if you could get ostensible agreement on this voluntary restraint, I can't imagine the Secretary General being eager to be the one to decide whether vetoes are going to be cast or not. This would get him almost insuredly into trouble with the big powers, or worse yet, he would have to soft pedal and potentially keep his mouth shut when atrocities were taking place and lose his moral authority. So I'm not sure he's the right one. So then is it the Human Rights Council? Are they the right body for it? Is it the High Commissioner for Human Rights? Is it the Special Representative on Genocide? And, and um, so it's, there's a lot that would have to be worked out. Although, you know, obviously the intentions are terrific here. I don't know how that works in practice. And I'm not seeing a ton of political will and to move it forward. But it's still on the table. Yeah. And that means that's something. The, on the issue of Security Council reform, it's been interesting that um, my sense is that the Obama administration came in feeling fairly, if not excited about Security Council reform, at least open to it in a way that some previous UN and US administrations were not. But I think it was very telling. You mentioned that when there was this period when India, Germany, Brazil were on the Security Council, and I think the US was not very pleased yeah. with how they performed. Um, you know, there was a feeling that they were hostile to the Libya intervention, that they were... So from the U.S. perspective, I, I, my sense is that the, any enthusiasm for Security Council reform has really drained away during the, uh, the Obama administration's tenure. 
Um, if I can go to you, Allison, and also a question about UN reform in a sense, but reform kind of of peacekeeping practices. Peacekeeping, of course, developed in the late 40s, early 50s, primarily as a vehicle for um, interposing forces between states. Um, and one of the bedrock principles of peacekeeping was that they were supposed to be impartial. They were supposed to be neutral as between the parties. Um, that, those principles have been tested quite a bit as the UN has gotten into complex civil conflicts, uh, basically state building kind of enterprises. And that has led in turn to discussions about whether UN peacekeepers should be able to use force more assertively, and you've already alluded to this, um, you know, much as maybe a domestic police force would. And it seems to me that one of the more notable um, attempts, uh, recent innovations in this respect, is the intervention brigade of the UN in the, in, its, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I know you've been focusing a lot on Sudan and Mali, but I wonder um, what your thoughts are about the success of this more muscular intervention brigade in Congo, and maybe more broadly where we stand in terms of the thinking on peacekeepers and the use of force. Um, on the intervention brigade, I think, first of all, it's in my mind, quite important to separate the, the idea that the intervention brigade is for protection of civilians versus for stabilization, because mm -hmm. that's really what the intervention brigade was. Um, a number of African uh, countries from, from the region around Congo um, deployed troops under the UN hat to come in as the intervention brigade after the fall of Goma. So after an armed rebel group called the M23 took Goma, which is a major city, it's the capital of, of the eastern province. Um, they sent in the intervention brigade to kind of go in there and for the first time what is called neutralize the M23 and other armed actors. Now neutralize is a word that, uh, that the UN would normally be very allergic to because it suggests that it's offensive force rather than using sort of a very defensive deterrent um, posturing as a, as a military force. Um, and they put all sorts of caveats in the mandate to allow for this to happen. And the, the question was, do they allow the intervention brigade to happen on its own under these African, under the African Union or just as sort of a, a, a regional um, intervention? Or is it better to actually put it under the UN hat so that it's easier to manage and there can be more coordination, communication, et cetera? And I think people were also very frustrated by the fact that MINUSCO hadn't been able to prevent the fall of GOMA when it's been there for years. And one of the reasons it has kept um, quite a few troops in the East was exactly to protect the, the, what is a very strategic um, position. So I think that um, although they have all these caveats in the mandate, that we are actually seeing much more of, at this point, a move towards a more robust use of force. We're seeing it in Mali. Um, so MINUSCO, MINUSMA in Mali, and MINUSCA in CAR all have the term stabilization now in their, in their names rather than a peacekeeping force. There's really no agreement on what stabilization means um, within the UN, but it seems to indicate that there is going to be more of a use of force. And I think in some ways that can be a good thing because the UN is now being deployed into areas not just where you have um, interstate conflict, but where you're facing a lot of other threats, um, IEDs, et cetera, coming from other types of non-state armed actors. And the UN needs to be ready for that. And I think you know, if you go to the training academies and, and whatnot, it's still training on scenarios from 10 years ago instead of looking at now and 10 years ahead which can be very dangerous for peacekeepers and I think has implications for whether people are going to continue to deploy going forward. Either they're not going to want to put their folks in that position where they can get harmed and they're not going to be using to use force um, in order to protect themselves from being harmed in those situations. So um, I, I do think right now we're in a trend of moving more towards the use of force, but as we've seen since the 1940s, it's been sort of a pendulum mm -hmm. where they rock back and forth between more force and then less force. So we'll have to see if, if this is you know, actually going up or if it's just a pendulum. And I, I do want to just um, also acknowledge that my colleague Bill Dirch is there and he may disagree with me and knows far more than me. So um, <laughs> I'm encouraging him to raise his hand and jump in if he has any comments at any point. <laughs> um, well, with that, I think uh, I'd like to kind of open it up here. I mean, I have 
dozens more questions for both of you, but I'd love to try to open it up to the floor. Um, and, and Bill Dirch, if you had an intervention that you'd like to make, that would obviously be very welcome. Um, but I would like to have a broader conversation at this point, if we can. David, I would, I, I... Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a microphone that's circulating. That would be great. Uh, thanks, David. I, I actually just uh, actually a, a comment at uh, more or less higher altitude uh, level, kind of starting with Mike's initial comments and, and coming forward, uh, especially on the Security Council. I mean, it was deadlocked when it was born because the assumptions were wrong. Stalin was not a good buddy. But it unlocked post-Cold War, and for, for 20 years, even after uh, Putin Medvedev or Medvedev Putin or whichever order they were working in came to power, it continued to work. and and to authorize uh, fairly uh, strong missions, especially in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I think if you look closely, it, what, is, what was true when the veto was invented is still true. And that is the UN doesn't do anything especially meaningful in, in, in security within the spheres of interest of the veto wielders unless they want it to. So we really want the UN to be in Haiti because we want emigration from Haiti to be controlled be to keep we want the conditions there to be so at least good enough that n everybody doesn't want to leave at once and go to Florida so which was the case in 1994 uh, Ukraine is well within the Russian sphere of influence used to be part of the Soviet Union it's sort of like if Texas seceded uh, I'll leave it up to the audience as to whether we would then go pursue Texas but um, it, it's a similar uh, geographic juxtaposition the Middle East, ever since the founding of the State of Israel, which the UN was largely responsible for blessing in 1948, has been a de facto sphere of influence, or a contested sphere of influence. First between us and the British and the French, right? Suez, in, in the 50s. Then between the, us and the British and the French and the Russians. So uh, it, it's sort of an honorary sphere of influence, if, if, if that you call that an honor. So that's why it's still a mess, and, and why it's very difficult for the UN to do anything close to the P5. But there wouldn't be a UN without the veto. So that's the kind of the conundrum that we're stuck with. But there are parts of the world where it does do its job that Allison was uh, addressing and that we address most in our work. Uh, it could use a lot more help. It could use more help from the developed world. Um, it could use a lot more political support. But it's actually amazing if you think about it that as many of these things have been uh, mandated with the strengths of the mandates that they've had, that they do have, even today. It is, it is really interesting to, I mean, there are kind of two, there's the geo, big geopolitics of the UN, then there's the UN's operational side. And one question I thought I'd, you know, lay out here, and you, we should go to the floor, I think, first, but is whether the big geopolitical frictions and tensions have much impact on what the UN is doing on the operational side. I mean, does it matter that, the, that you know, Samantha Power and Vitaly Cherkin are yelling at each other about Ukraine when it comes to a peacekeeping operation in Sudan, or does it not? I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. But let's, let's go to the, uh, to the floor. Um, I know there are some students from world politics here who have, um, are, are brimming with questions. And anyone else, of course. <laughs> yeah, Professor Quinton. Let me for, just for a moment uh, take you in a slightly different direction. I, many years ago I was ambassador in the Central African Republic. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that this country has torn itself apart in the way that it has. Um, but I'm really interested in where we're going. A and it seems to me that there are two dimensions that might be interesting to comment on. One is the growing institutionalization of R2P. From since 2005, the idea that the United Nations is somehow committed to the responsibility to protect, and that leads to some of the questions that you raised as to who protects and how, and how do you determine a, a threshold for protection uh, here. The CAR is perhaps a pretty good case of where it's worked, and Libya was a case where it didn't. And that leads me to the other side of the equation which keeps coming up in this city, which is that we are more predisposed to, to think of ourselves as leading coalition, ad hoc coalitions of the willing, rather than turning to the Security Council to mobilize a coalition. And Libya is a case, was a case in point, of course, where uh, 
NATO was mobilized in an R2P context. Uh, and it, it remains to be seen what's going to be happening in, in the Levant, uh, of course. But how do you see this tension between uh, the mobilization capabilities of the United States and the mobilization capabilities of the United Nations against the background of what is a, a, an increasing demand that we recognize a responsibility to protect and try to do something about it? Anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll start, and I'll start uh, by pointing out, I think um, Bill brings up some really good points, and I think bridges nicely the bottom up and the top down, this sort of middle section um, that didn't really get talked about, and which is sort of the bridge between the council and peacekeeping itself, that there is this sort of sweet spot in between where the Security Council is not so invested. It's not their so-called spheres of influence invite, so they're willing to sort of mandate real operations but they're not so indifferent that they're basically not willing to actually invest any real troops or money or anything else into it or strong protection mandates and so forth and back them up with resources. And I think that's all really important. I think that's a key area of activism in the UN. And it's also an area that is very easily forgotten. I remember in the aftermath of Iraq 2003, there was this view that the council was done for, that it had just been such an ugly fight um, that France and the United States couldn't even get along. And then within years, they were already mandating new, mm-hmm. counts, the new peacekeeping missions. And they were up to 100,000, uh, I think, within five or six years. I'd have to check the exact numbers. Mm-hmm. And there was this really this, this, flu, uh, this period of sort of return to this uh, cooperation on this sort of sweep swat area between the two, and a lot more protection mandates in particular uh, for the first time, um, which I think bridges over to this question of R2P, um, which is, I think, I, I think I, don't, I don't think all those protection mandates come with with a specific reference to R2P. They often just say protection. Protection. And so I think that's important, because I think especially Kofi Annan, when he was there, really thought that, you know, he, he liked, he supported R2P, it championed the broadly the human security agenda, but he worried at one point in time that it wasn't his agenda to push too far forward. And so he really, he did not, he did not want the uh, initial report on state sovereignty, International Commission of State Sovereignty. He, does not want, he did not want it under the UN umbrella. It was initially done outside the UN. And the way champion that he thought his biggest role could be helping to institutionalize the protection and this responsibility within the UN, whether it was convening troop contributing countries to start thinking about what it actually meant on the ground, what realistically the UN could expect from its troop contributors in terms of standing their ground when there's protection issues. And these are very much ongoing issues that I've been told they kind of dropped off under Ban Ki-moon. But I think that's sort of one, uh, one key element that's going on is you know, trying to get, I think DPKO in a lot of ways understands the best practices a little this better. This is the Department of Peacekeeping, Peacekeeping Operations, Operations within yeah. the UN. But the troop contributors, it's nowhere. I mean, the recent report from the internal inspectors was basically pretty brutal on the UN, having been close by and not really responded to potential protection issues. Um, and, and often saying the troop contributors were very nervous about actually getting involved in firefights when they didn't feel they had the capability to win. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a really big one. Uh, coalitions of the willing. Um, so there is this idea, but they, I don't think they were ever too alternative tension, right? The idea, at least when the Bush administration the current, in the initial Gulf War was, you know, you build the coalition diplomatically, bilaterally, but you consolidate it with this UN authorization, right? And that's what would really push it over the edge. It would help justify a lot of these Arab, leagues come, Arab countries coming on board. Canada and the United States felt really strongly that it should have UN authorization. Relatively new norm, this idea that you should get council authorization to use force. Didn't happen in... Um, it didn't happen in Kosovo, although the Clinton administration at least said, look, we'd love, we would love a UN blessing, but we just, it's just not reasonable and we can't keep waiting while these while ethnic cleansings going on on the ground. Um, interesting, we are not, there is no real evidence, I don't think, that this is that anyone seeking council authorization with respect to the ISIS mission, mainly because the Iraqis are consenting to it, and so the reason you'd go to the council is because you wanted to be able to potentially launch airstrikes inside of Syria without the government's consent, and it's hard to imagine the Russians ever agreeing to that. That being said, I did read the other day, and this is interesting, because I don't know if it means anything or not. Um, there was a draft resolution when the president is going to chair this council. He did, he's, the thematic issue is foreign terrorist fighters. And within it, it's very clear that the president's goal, if this draft resolution is in fact the one that's put forward, that he wants these groups, including by name, they cite ISIS to be recognized as a threat to international peace and security, for action to be taken under Chapter 7, which is peace enforcement. Uh, and for basically all countries to have to take on some obligation. Again, not authorization for force, but at least an attempt to say, look, the UN Security Council, even these countries who don't usually agree with each other, all agree this is a threat that needs to be dealt with and and maybe providing, I don't know whether they'll draw on it or not, but it was an interesting early draft. I don't know if it's going anywhere or not. Mm -hmm. But I think it speaks to this idea that we're still, I think it's, 
you know, it's not as settled as norm, and, and it'll be interesting where the next goes, the next sort of few years go. Al Allison, did you have a quick response on responsibility to protect? And um, actually, I'll let go to other questions because I will answer that, but okay. I'll do it with some others. Okay, that's great. Uh, let's go right to the back there, and if you could just wait for the mic to come around, that would be great. And if you don't mind, um, just introducing yourself briefly. Hi, I'm Alex Davis. I am a student in Professor Bosco's class, and my question is for the panel: Is um, is the Security Council beyond repair? And if yes, I mean, there's nothing you can really say. But if no, what repairs? <laughs> what repairs do you feel um, can be made in order for the Security Council to be relevant and useful? Okay. Beyond repair? <laughs> Silence. It, it's beyond repair, I, I'm afraid. That's right. <laughs> well, we're done here. Uh, I guess I should de-mic. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is beyond repair. I think Bill brought up a lot of reasons why it's still able to put missions in the field, while there's still a lot of smart people working on these problems about how to make it better in the field. Um, you know, there's big political problems from troop contributing to political conflicts within the council. Um, but I think part of this is to recognize that it, it can do some things, even in these big conflicts. I still do think it provides a reason for these countries, the major powers, to keep talking. And if they want to use that as an excuse not to potentially escalate a conflict, they can to some extent. And I, or at the very end, at least they can sharpen that. And they can keep getting better at peacekeeping, and particularly this protection issue. I really think this is amazing that these 100,000 people are being protected. I mean, this is not, this was kind of, I think it's relatively ad hoc the way they've thrown this together, right? The same thing in Seattle, they started showing up people in a lot of ways. And they're still, I think they're still relatively successful to date anyway. This is very different than some of the protection failures in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. it's, you choose to believe that, at the very least, the UN's going to have a hard time ever claiming that it's not their job to protect anymore. And that's a step. Um, in terms of how the council, I mean, there's always talk about how you improve its working methods. Um, you know, and I think a big one for the council is how you get other stakeholders involved in these consultations. Um, if consultations do matter at all, then you probably want other countries, whether it's going to be troop contenders to, op uh, to peace operations, or whether it's going to be other countries who have leverage with the parties. And I think figuring out informal ways of making sure they feel they have a stake in it might provide sort of help this dynamic to sort of expand beyond the major members. Yeah, and maybe if you, in responding to that question, if you can also just talk about the Security Council and how effective it is on kind of a day-to-day -day basis of managing peacekeeping operations. Yeah, so um, this is great. I was sort of going to the next question, so I had more time to answer the previous question rather than give a short answer. Um, there I am showing my hand again. Um, so uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I actually think there's a lot of cooperation happening with the U within the UN Security Council that you don't see. Um, there's a lot of political posturing that happens, um, but there's a lot that is functioning, especially on protection of civilians behind closed doors. And um, for example, there are uh, meetings that happen between uh, certain members, trios of the Security Council around how to strengthen peacekeeping at the, opera at the very operational level. So how do you get other troop contributing countries to, to, to put forth their troops and assets? Um, Vice President Biden is about to host a, a summit during the UNGA that is just about this. Um, he's, he's come together with a bunch of partners um, to get other countries to help step up as well as, you know, put forward what the U.S. is doing to step up. So I, I, I actually don't think the UN Security Council is, is, is as broken as we would like to see it. They're, they're actually getting much smarter at how to manage that relationship. Um, they do have a lot of tensions with the UN General Assembly's Fifth Committee, which actually decides all of the budgets for peacekeeping operations, because obviously on the Security Council, they're the ones that keep putting forth these really ambitious, um, sometimes a dangerous, often dangerous mandates for peacekeeping operations, but then most of the troop contributing countries are in the UN uh, General Assembly and not uh, in the UN Security Council. And you also have this, a lot of the people on Security Council don't actually donate their own troops. They're the donors versus, versus the ones that are putting their lives on the line. Um, so those relationships have been very difficult to manage um, and are sometimes more important when it comes to peacekeeping operations than internally within the UN Security Council, um, depending on the mission. Um, and, and I actually think those, are, those have been very bad for the last few years, but now they're coming to more agreements on, for example, what they're going to pay mm -hmm. to troops. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing uh, really helps 
than with the relationships. And those are things we need to look at is how the UN Security Council is using its role. And I do just want to say one other thing about the US, because I mentioned um, President, Vice President Biden's summit. But there are lots of ways also that, that um, which Mike was sort of uh, speaking to before, that, um, that you can use being a permanent rep or an ambassador to the UN that doesn't necessarily involve the UN Security Council. So Ambassador Power and her leadership, what she did with the Central African Republic was, was beyond what you would normally expect of, a, of an ambassador to the UN. It was sort of going, you know, it was using her position to mobilize a number of resources and assets within and beyond the UN. Um, and so I think that that's another way in which the Security Council isn't broken. Um, even though it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the expected path. Okay. Um, let's go to a couple more questions. I think we have about ten more minutes, but I'm hoping we can get in several more questions. Maybe let's take uh, let's take these two here together, um, if we can, and maybe have the panelists respond to to both of them. Uh, so the, um, first of all, hi. My name is Ken Mann. I'm a uh, freshman at SIS in uh, Professor Bosco's class. Uh, I had a question specifically for uh, Ms. Giffen in regards to the uh, UN peacekeeping mission in uh, South Sudan. You would mentioned like possible reforms or improvements to the you know peacekeeping mission state or base in Juba there. And I was curious as to what specifically those improvements were. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tristan. I'm also a freshman. I'm actually in the same uh, class as Ken with Professor Bosco, and. Uh, my question had to do with uh, uh, along the topic of uh, the the intervention brigade uh, with uh, the two kind of hotbed conflicts that we're seeing now Ukraine and Crimea and then uh, the Middle East with ISIS uh, you, we've already seen uh, how America has already begun dedicating airstrikes uh, unilaterally and how NATO was uh, taking a stronger stance against uh, in condemning Russia uh, more so than the UN was really willing to do. So uh, in these two situations, do you think the UN could uh, do the same thing where they would finally come to an agreement and kind of put their hat on each operation in the two regions? Or would they be so deadlocked, especially uh, like with Ukraine, would Russia just be too much of a block to the point where it would basically become a, um, a, a multilateral uh, operation, but not necessarily with the UN blessing upon mm -hmm. it? Okay, so I'm going to assign those. The first one to you, maybe, on the, yeah. on the specifics of the, of the mission in South Sudan, and then maybe have Mike try to respond on that. I'll sing both if she likes. No, no. We divided the, the regions up That's before true. we sat. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence. True. Um, so on hat. South Sudan, I think, again, another um, example of where the UN Security Council is working in some ways. Um, when uh, everything went pear-shaped in South Sudan, the Security Council finally agreed to do what was pretty radical which was strip the mandate of, of UNMIS um, temporarily, took all the state building, all the capacity building off of the mandate so that it's fully focused on protection of civilians. That's a very radical move for the, for the Security Council to do. Um, it's a temporary measure, but it helps the peacekeeping operation be more impartial because the peacekeeping operation was being targeted by all sides. Um, they lost a lot of peacekeepers, both um, from sort of lower level armed threats, but then they were also being targeted um, publicly uh, by the heads of the, the two armed parties. So um, it, it helps make them more impartial, but it also helps them try and focus all of their resources. So they just went through a big civilian staffing review to try and figure out how to move all of their resources to that. They're also going through a big thinking of reconfiguration of where they're going to move their troops and assets to try and do protection of civilians. Um, over the last few months, um, working with humanitarians, they've tried to improve the conditions inside the camps. Um, if any of you have read, because they were so unexpected to have these 100,000, and a lot of the UN bases in South Sudan were not given nice land by the government of South Sudan in the first place. Um, so there tend to be swamp areas that flood easily. And so people were in these areas, 100,000, not in, in, I mean, in horrible conditions with water up to their thighs, climbing into trees to try and get out of the water. Um, they're trying to use engineering equipment of UNMIS and others to try and make it more livable within the camp. Um, I don't think we're going to see a lot of the people inside moving out anytime soon. Um, and it, that's just because the people that I spoke with and others that work very closely, the individual and collective trauma of these people is so large. And then there's also political motivations um, as to why people don't want to move, and there's security motivations as to why people don't want to move. Um, 
So I think it's, it's going to be very hard given that and given the, the serious lack of resources that continue that they're going to be able to go out and create protective spaces outside of the UN bases for people to sort of go back and return to their neighborhoods. Um, but I do think they're going to be able to do better protection around the sites, protection so that people can go to the market, can go to hospital, can go get water, can get food outside of the sites and come back. Um, and then after they've done that, maybe they'll be able to create you know, more security beyond that. But I think that's got to be the first priority. It's a sad priority because the 100,000 is 10 percent of the population that's been displaced by violence. But it, it's the most immediate um, protection need that needs, needs to be addressed. All right, um, Mike, if you can, the question on Ukraine and, and ISIS and whether there's any prospect that um, either of the responses to these could kind of come under the UN umbrella at some point. Uh, no, I mean, I think the short answer is probably highly unlikely for the reasons that Bill pointed out. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, in the Ukraine, I think it's a non-starter. Uh, I mean, I don't know what would happen. I guess in theory, you could might be able to get some I can't even imagine like a Bosnia-like situation mm -hmm. after where you get peacekeeping forces with half Russians or something like that. I just I can't imagine what that would even look like. Um, in the ISIS case, again, I just don't think the Russians, number one, there's no way you could have a blue helmeted intervention mission. I mean, at the end, the United States is not going to lead a coalition of blue helmets. It doesn't like having to, everything from picking targets from every other operational problems that come with that. And I just don't see how the Russians would ever want to authorize a mission where the United States could bomb inside Syria without Assad's consent, not until something dramatically changed from where we are now. Um, so I just don't see those as likely prospects. Again, what you're more likely to get is some sort of thematic uh, agreement in the council that foreign terrorist fighters are a problem and potentially naming ISIS in that. And that's, I guess, is as far as it's probably going to go, mm -hmm. um, at least that I can see now. That being said, I've been wrong many a time. So it wouldn't, uh, it certainly could. It's also not the right tool for ISIS. I mean, yeah, it, right. it, right. it, it, simply the UN will not have capabilities for the next 10 to 20 years until they're behind the current threat again to be able to even deal with something like that. So we also have to think of when is the UN appropriate to actually try and get political support behind. Um, and I would say in, in the case of Libya, which I didn't answer your question, sorry, um, that you know, that there was actually backing by the League of Arab States um, and the UN mm -hmm. to go in and do that. Um, they, they did ask for consent. The consent was only sort of withdrawn or backed up on after the fact. And that's mm -hmm. not just because of the level of use of force, which is what was sort of the public position. There was a lot of disagreement about how the coalition chose or chose not to communicate with South Africa, with Brazil, et cetera. Um, and, and how they conducted the operation. So I think, again, it's sometimes there's a lot going on behind the scenes that isn't about what they're actually saying publicly um, that is what's causing the, the you know, what's, why they're upset about R2P. It's not always R2P. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's try to get two more questions, if we can, um, together, just as we did. And maybe I'll go here for one, if I could, and then uh, to the gentleman in the gray T-shirt. Hi, I'm Lisa Jacobson. I'm with Search for Common Ground. I just had a question because recently the UN passed a resolution reaffirming their right, their kind of commitment to building peace and preventing atrocities. Kind of for both of you, where do we see this going? Does this going both bottom up and top down approach? Is this, is this a question about accountability primarily or? It's just, so the, the resolution that recently they kind of were just were re they kind of recognized that they had had problems. They weren't really the accountability, I would say, mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Great. Um, and then if, you, if we could get the mic back to Oh, thank hi. you. Hi. Um, hi, my name is uh, XY. And I just have a, I have a question here about um, whenever a state kind of, uh, or I mean, an actor in the world kind of uh, does something that violates um, what the UN would believe is a uh, human right, um, uh, it condemns it. Whenever the UN condemns uh, an action, what does I mean? What does that mean? What does what does that entail? Is I mean, how much power does it have when it comes to something like that? Great. Um, okay, so maybe to to Lisa's question about um, what you know, is there accountability for failures in of of R2P? Accountability for situations in which the UN has not uh, performed adequately? I mean, obviously we had the situations in Srebrenica in the in the 90s and and in Rwanda. Um, how have we made progress in terms of accountability of, of the UN? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, well, in Srebrenica, you probably saw that there were recently peacekeepers that were held accountable in a in a domestic court, a Dutch court, a Dutch yeah. court, um, for not acting. But beyond that, there isn't really what you would call accountability for peacekeepers when they fail. Um, there are some professional ramifications, um, but I actually, it, it's very hard to find examples where um, people even at the top, the leadership of missions that have been there when something has failed, have, have had, you know, a horrible things happen to them because they were at the top of the leadership when a crisis happened like that. So I don't think accountability, but I think also you're talking about the resolution on the responsibility to protect in Pillar 2 in peace building. And there I actually think we're seeing progress because a lot of people frame responsibility to protect as the third pillar, which is the first pillar is that governments have the responsibility to protect their own citizens. If they aren't able to protect their own citizens, then you go to pillar two, in which case the international community has a responsibility to provide support um, to the host state government. And if that doesn't help um, and the government doesn't have um, either the will or the capacity um, then you can get outside intervention and you can do that without the consent of the host state government. But there's been a lot of work to try and show that there's a lot of steps that you can take before you get to the point where you're at a Libya where you've got to go in against the consent of, of, the, of the sovereign. Um, and in there I think they're making a lot of progress. Um, the Secretary General put forth a lot of different issues of ways in which um, uh, in which the international community can be supporting peace building so that it doesn't get to the point of a, of a pillar three. And so if we're getting beyond accountability and we're looking in a positive direction, I think the concept of R2P is continuing to evolve in a very positive direction and there are people putting tools to operationalize it on the ground. And then Mike, if, uh, and this may be the last, uh, the last word, but to XY's question on uh, kind of what's the value of a UN condemnation. I mean, the Security Council will pass resolutions. The General Assembly will condemn various things. The UN Human Rights Council is very active now. Um, you know, what, is it, what does it all matter in the end if it's just words? <laughs> Good question. Million dollar question. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the Human Rights Council was still trying to figure out exactly what it means when they condemn them. There's certainly some evidence, and not from people you're talking about, from scholars, that condemnation from the Council Human Rights Commission and its predecessor could potentially hurt uh, various uh, other international organizations might use it when they're trying to decide. This is, there's some evidence to show that I think it's the World Bank loans hmm. um, and your ability to how the conditions attached to them can depend on these sorts of things. But it's sort of a correlation, so we don't really have strong evidence. And I can't cite a case offhand. Can I, can yeah, I just make one yeah. comment on that? So um, the Human Rights Council, they're, they're, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has special um, mechanism, special procedures where and, and different um, uh, high level people who go in and do investigations. And then there are divisions, offices of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Human Rights Divisions that are inside peacekeeping operations and are on the ground or inside political missions. And I, I have to say, at least in the case of South Sudan, um, Human Rights Watch has said, and we've recently seen, that when some of the major atrocities were happening, when the, when the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights got out there and did reporting really quick and that got out publicly, that it actually did have an impact on how the parties were acting as they were negotiating in the political sphere and what they were giving up because they were getting um, really pummeled publicly for the, for the atrocities that they committed. And so that's sort of at the low level, but those reports go up through the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and then they get shared with the Human Rights Council. So it's not just at the very strategic level that these mechanisms, I think, can, can actually have a real impact on the ground. A lot of armed actors use violence against civilians very deliberately, but a lot of them are also very sensitive um, to, to their public profile, especially when they're in the middle of political negotiations. Yeah. So there's a real trade-off to using deliberate violence for strategic purposes when you're also trying to get favor with the international community. You all know that, but I just wanted to mention that because I think it's a it's a it's a recent case where we can show a correlation. There's also, I mean, the use of chemical weapons. I think when yeah. the UN report that hurt, especially the more recent one. I think it does. At the end of the day, I'm not sure if it changes the strategic situation, but I think those, the, you know, I think that made it very hard for Russians to block an OPCW attempt to, at least, not to try to put forward some action. They felt pressure. And I think we should assume that different actors have different uh, susceptibility to public pressure, and that yeah. some would be maybe quite susceptible and others 
it's not going to matter how many resolutions you pass about the Lord's Resistance Army. That may not make a difference. But, um, but others may be significantly more susceptible. And the UN's always, at least uh, ostensibly on paper, tried to build up and say, look, you know, part of it's not just condemnatory and criticism. You know, in theory, they're supposed to be working with these sort of national human rights institutes to build up capacity in a number of governments that have historically had weak ombudsmen. Um, for people who study this, it's not clear the High Commissioner of Human Rights has had the time to kind of devote to that or that, you know, mm -hmm. that they've had, but they start to put some best practice together. So it's capacity building, at least, that they're supposed to be working on. Um, I'm not sure with this rights up front, if that's helped or not, but I get, I get the sense that uh, it, it's, there's some sort of skepticism. Well, this has been, uh, I mean, I'm now entering the time of the General Assembly much better informed um, than I was. <laughs> and I hope, I, I think that's probably true for, for the group as a whole. Um, I really think this kind of collaboration, um, Stimson, SIS, um, kind of on the ground perspective, a more uh, higher level theoretical perspective is really valuable. Um, and so I hope you'll join me in, uh, in thanking uh, the participants and uh, Dean Golgeier and Alan Leipson from, from the Stimson Center.